I want to welcome you here. My name is Joshua Cole. I'm the director of the Center for European Studies. Um, and before I introduce our speaker today, um, I would just want to uh, 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 get you to note that we have some publicity materials for some upcoming lectures. Um, on Thursday, October 18th, in this room uh, at 4 p.m., Lucia Taioli, a visiting professor from the uh, um, uh, university in Milan, is going to be speaking on the Eurozone crisis from an Italian perspective. On Tuesday, October 23rd, also in this room at 4 p.m., Morgane Labbé, um, a visiting professor from the École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, uh, the School for Advanced Studies in Social Sciences, um, is going to give a debate on French, I'm uh, sorry, going to give a paper on the French debate on statistics and ethnic minorities. Um, this is the debate on whether it is permissible for the French state to record information about people's claimed ethnic identity. Uh, the French state normally has not thought that it was permissible for, uh, to keep track of this kind of information, and now they are considering doing so. Um, finally, Thursday, November 1st at 4 p.m., um, uh, Sakis Gekas, an assistant professor uh, at York University, <coughs> is going to speak on the colonial Mediterranean and its place in European history, uh, something perhaps that will be many tie-ins with Natalie's paper today. So let me begin with a little bit of a reflection here. Crises, Natalie is going to talk today about the crisis, Crises and miracles have at least one thing in common. They produce a kind of vertigo. They disorient us. They cast our certainties adrift. They make our sense of what is normal and routine into something fragile, fleeting, maybe even unsafe. Now, I came upon this reflection in reading a remarkable story by our speaker today. You can find it online. It's called Megaphone. It's a story about a woman in Athens who, in the course of an otherwise normal morning of facing the day in a Greece beset by turmoil and strikes, a day where worries about trash collection mingle with um, her worries about being a single mother, is suddenly confronted with the fact that her young son can fly. He can hover. He can hold his body in the air at will. He can glide from one place to another, and he can land with the gentleness of a leaf on soft ground. Her shock at this fact produces no catharsis, only astonishment, anxiety that he might fall and hurt himself, a sudden fear that perhaps the boy's father might have known about this before she did. She quizzes him, and he responds in the language of shrugs and sideward glances that kids have, she asks him if he, can fl if he flies at school, and he responds incredulously, nobody does. Finally, unable to do anything else, she drops him off at school after admonishing him, just at home, okay? Now, it was this moment in the story that, that stuck with me when I'd finished. It wouldn't let me go. What, what did it mean that she just dropped him off at school? after discovering that he could fly flo floating above the sidewalk in his Spider-Man suit. What did the story mean? Did the story mean to say that our children are miraculous, but we must keep them from acknowledging it? That our routines, putting out the garbage, going to school, whether we move in with our lovers or not, these are all things that come up in the story, that these routines are what constitute us as humans, what keep us together as families, as nations, and we must cling to them, even as we know how artificial and fragile they are. The story poses these questions, but it doesn't really try and answer them. And it's all the more haunting for this restraint. It's because of this feeling that this story left with, left with me as I read it this summer um, that I um, am so very pleased to introduce Natalie Bokopoulos to you today. She is herself from Michigan. She grew up in the United States in a family that had preserved its connections to Greece by continuing to speak the language and surrounding itself with the sounds and sensations of Greek culture. And this engagement continued in her literary work. She uh, published her first novel, um, quite re Wendy, what year did it come out? This past June, re very quite recently. Um, there is, I read an excerpt on it this week uh, online. 
It's called The Green Shore, about one family's experience of the military coup in Greece in 1967 and its aftermath. Um, let me just, in order to um, read a couple of things that have been said about her writing so you understand uh, the extent to which she has already been so well received. Booklist r uh, writes about The Green Shore, deeply imbued with the passion and honor synonymous with Greek culture, abundant with sensuous imagery and stimulating discourse, Bacopoulos' debut novel is a sumptuous and provocative portrait of the nexus of the personal with the political. Time Out Chicago wrote, an astute accounting of the way the political, that, that political climates shift inner lives. Chicago Tribune wrote, Bacopoulos, Bacop, Bac, Bacopoulos, excuse me, has an enormous heart, and she is a writer to watch. We are fortunate that we get to hear her as well. The title of her talk today is Athens, Notice Your Poet. Thank you, Joshua, for that lovely introduction. And thanks so much to the Center for European Studies and the Modern Greek Program for um, giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you this afternoon. And um, also, thank you all for coming. One, I'd like to start with the words of the poet George Seferis from his journal. Man is always double, he who acts and he who sees himself acting, he who suffers and he who sees himself suffering, he who feels and he who observes himself feeling. The self-awareness, Seferis noted, is fundamentally human, sure. But I don't think anyone has more intense self-awareness than a writer. We are always aware of the action, while at the same time, we're observing it. Likewise, in the academy, creative writers are both members of and outside the scholarly community. We're like that slightly off-balance friend you have that you invite to your dinner parties, cringe when she arrives with lipstick on her teeth and a bottle of bourbon, and hope she doesn't knock anything over or stay too late. The idea of creative writers in the academy is a strange thing, working side by side in the same departments who de deconstruct us, analyze us. We're happy to be here, but often feel a little bit anxious, as though it might be a mistake that any moment the academy might reconsider and tell us kindly with a look of pity and pain on its face, yeah, it was nice having you. You're really nice, all of you, and fun to be around, but I don't think it's going to work out. Can we still be friends? Creative writers are not scholars in that we generally don't know a lot about one particular thing. That is, our study is the art and craft of writing itself. But that craft leads us down different paths. We write about anything that interests us, find immersing ourselves in one thing before going on to the next. Maybe it seems flighty, dilettantish. We might settle on something broad, like concepts that obsess us, exile, isolation, gender, or places where our imaginations stay. For me, that place is Greece, specifically Athens. Because of this, although our knowledge on a topic could be as deep as a trained scholar, we constantly wonder if at any moment someone might knock on our office doors and carry us away, yelling, you're a fraud. I'm being a bit sarcastic here. Because really, our goals are the same as those, traditional as those of traditional scholars, to educate young minds and to generate, engage with, and challenge new and established ideas. I was both honored and slightly horrified, though, when the Center for European Studies asked me to give this talk. And when I accepted, I mentioned that in my, my perspective would be that of a novelist who writes about Athens. I'm not an economist or a political scientist or a historian. And today, I appear before you as an essayist. As Montaigne coined it, an essay is a try, an attempt. And so as, it's as this that I offer you these words today about fraud and authenticity, about uncertainty and identity, about inclusion and exile, about poetry and truth, and of course, how all this relates to my beloved city of Athens. Two, Tino Sise, whose are you? Greek grandmother on the beach in Kithnos, 2006. The summer of my first novel, which is set primarily in Athens during the military junta of 1967 to 1974, was published, and I spent all of June traveling from city to city, reading at bookstores. After a reading in Portland, Oregon, when I began the question and answer portion, a nice-looking middle-aged man was the first to raise his hand to speak. He was standing in the back, and everyone turned to face him. I want to make something clear to this audience, he said. For those of us who were there, he said, this period was hugely memorable. I sucked in my breath and was glad I had a beer before my reading. <laughs> a former student of mine was in the audience, and he sucked his breath in, too. Oh, boy, he said. Here we go. 
As a Greek American with a Greek father and a host of friends in Greece, I am used to expressing something and then waiting for the phrase, let me correct you. So I waited, knowing that this moment had only been a matter of time. I prepared to be gracious and thoughtful. He went on. I don't think an audience that is outside of Greece will understand just how perfectly you capture this period, the mood, the ambiance, the thoughts of the characters. I, dear listeners, was shocked. <laughs> and he went on. This man was not an actor. I didn't pay him to be in the audience, but I would have. I'm not saying this to establish credibility or to brag. Surely there are many readers and critics who will think I got it all wrong. And so my anxiety is not one only of my position in a university. It's the anxiety of, right, of the writer that what Charles Baxter terms the fraud police, those imaginary arbiters of entitlement that exist in our mind and continually tell us that we don't know what we're doing. The goal is simply not to correct us, but to humiliate us. If you have ever written anything scholarly or creative, you probably know the feeling. You probably understand what it means to abandon your desk far too early in the afternoon, find yourself at happy hour, talking with other writer friends about how, n about how none of you are writing. But at some point, you have to trust that you have something to say, find a way to keep the police silent, or at least from breaking down your office door, and continue working. But you know they're there. They keep you honest. Other readers and many critics might say I got it all wrong. And throughout the entire process, I worried the same. Though I try to comfort myself with, writer, with what writer Nadine Gordimer said in her Nobel Prize acceptance speech, nothing factual that I write or say will be as truthful as my fiction. The life, the opinions are not the work, for it's in the tension between standing apart and being involved that the imagination transforms both. Fiction, after all, I think, creates its own truths, adds to the infinite possibilities of the universe. To write fiction is to both capture and create a history. Fiction isn't about what happened necessarily, but about what something felt like. Aristotle wrote in Poetics that the role of poetry is not to capture what happened, but what could have happened. And though a novel is an act of the imagination, I still agonize I'll never capture the place, or that I'll inevitably reduce it to cliches. Then again, most writers in one way or another are or have been outsiders. In some ways, I belong to so many elements of Greece, tourist, historian, writer, observer, daughter. In other ways, I belong to none of them. As a writer, I'm already a type of exile, existing in two places at once. As a Greek American, I'm also aware of this duality. I am doubly outside Greece's borders, even when I am within them. Three, the laziness of aphorism. But what does it mean to be Greek? I recently was asked by an interviewer for Odyssey magazine, are you Greek? What makes you Greek? Although sometimes the question might be posed with a small degree of accusation, you are not Greek enough, or how can someone not Greek write about Greece? There's also a true inquisitiveness there. What makes someone Greek? How is Greekness viewed from the outside and from within? I am Greek, of course, Greek American, but I didn't grow up with the typical trappings of Greek American life, the Greek school, Greek church, though they were still part of my consciousness. I suppose the worries that I would get something wrong stem not only because I was writing about a place in which I did not live or grow up, but also because issues of Greekness always seem to be present in Greece. I grant that I'm not particularly well suited to following rules, but I am uncomfortable with categories and strict definitions. As a human, I think it's short-sighted, and as a writer, I think it's artistically problematic. E.M. Forster, when talking about his novel, Where Angels Fear to Tread, said that someone noted of one of his characters that he must not think him to be a typical Italian. Forster replied, there is not much danger of my doing this, since I don't think anyone is a typical anything. I am a novelist, and my business lies with individuals, not with classifications. But regarding the question of Greekness and Greek identity, even if it has been on the back burner, the flame has always been lit. And now I think it's at full heat again, boiling, sputtering, crackling. But why? In some ways, Europe and the West have always been watching Greece, but I'm not going to go back to ancient Greece here, or the Ottoman occupation, or World War II, or even the junta. But I want to start with something more recent, the 2000 Athens Olympics, when Athens was racing to complete its venues. Its new subway system, its highways, its pedestrian routes across the major archaeological sites all to accommodate not only the games themselves, but the influx of bodies the games would bring. This is not unusual for any city. But the way the media approached Athens' preparations for the Olympics was always with a bit of disbelief, doubt, and even sometimes jeering, as if the Greeks were a bunch of disorganized, dim-witted, savage morons who could not possibly pull off such a complicated cosmopolitan event. 
when Athens pulled off not only a spectacular Olympic Games overall, but in particular, a stunning, beautiful, moving opening ceremony and closing that I still wonder if anyone will be able to top. The world was delighted and maybe a little stunned. And perhaps those who had doubted his abilities, and there were many, felt a little sheepish. Then it seemed Greece was in the spotlight again in 2008 with the death of 15-year-old Alexandros Grigoropoulos, who was shot by a police officer trying to break up a demonstration in the neighborhood of Exarchia, and weeks of protests followed. The protests were often peaceful and quiet, candlelit vigils, but most often we heard of the riots in Athens. This sort of thing continued with the crisis, the bailouts, the involvement of the European Central Bank, the European Commission, and the IMF, uh, collectively known as the Troika. As of now, about 8 billion euros worth of public sector pay cuts, welfare cuts, and pension cuts have been proposed for 2013 in order to allow Greece to get to the next installment of funds from the IMF in the Eurozone. But over half of young people are already unemployed, and now one in four Greeks is without a job. What is really left to cut? It is a severe punishment being dealt out to make a point, and its effects are going to be felt for generations. Greece is not only being watched, already devastated, it continues to be further humiliated on that global stage, kicked while it's already down. But for as many of us who seem to be who seem to be, or I'm sorry, but for as many who seem to be rooting for the Greeks to fail, I am not one of them, to be punished, we also love the underdog. This past summer, I was also asked by several journalists, how is the Greek character suited to making it through this crisis? Though I appreciate the glimmer of hope in this question, it always makes me cringe. The answer I think people want to hear is, yes, Greeks said no to the Italians. Greeks are resilient. Greeks have lived through worse. How can you say anything that doesn't conjure up some sort of dancing Zorba, Zembeki going away to combat misfortune, to lament the futility of death? It is the same simple-minded thinking that continually uses the already exhausted, hardworking ants, northern Europeans, and singing, lazy, carefree grasshoppers, southern Europeans, metaphor to explain the crisis. Amartya Sen, a professor at Harvard and winner of the 1998 Nobel Prize in Economics in his book Identity and Violence, argues that viewing identity as a singular, unchanging essence is dangerous. The idea that we can be neatly comp compartmentalized in a single overarching system of partitioning, he, he says, leads to an appalling so-called miniaturization of humanity with everyone living in their own, small, neatly defined boxes that they might venture out from occasionally to attack the other. The Greek composer Manos Hazidakis says, said, I don't like making out to be too Greek. I want to be as much as I am. High time the idea of being Greek is replaced by what it is to be a human being. Only then do I believe will we be bound up with a deeper tradition, which, as it happens, is also Greek. After all, to assign a particular rigid singular identity, a categorization of traits to a whole group of people is to undermine it of complexity. It's lazy. Such intellectual laziness is why politicians love the aphorism, which Susan Sontag called impatient thinking. Has the idea of Greekness become an aphorism, particularly when it's taken to be something to disparage an easy target or a slogan of pride to be emblazoned on a t-shirt? You can't lie in poetry, George Seferis said in a Paris Review interview with Edmund Keeley. If you are a liar, you will always be discovered. Keeley responded, when you speak of lying, you're speaking first of all about lying against your emotional, I don't know what I mean, Seferis answered. Perhaps it's an emotional thing, in the reality of one's thoughts, I don't know. I mean, there's a special sound about the solid, the sound thing. You knock against it, and it renders a sort of sound which proves it's genuine. What Seferis might be saying about genuineness, you know it when you see it. I find such comfort there in this idea of what is genuine and what is true, because when I'm in the process of writing and someone asks me what I'm writing about, I'm stuck, as if I have no words to express what it is I'm in the process of expressing with words. I need the entire thing to say what I'm going to say. If I didn't, I'd just say it in a few words, and that would be that. It's impossible to distill or partition or miniaturize. Also, the process of writing itself is just a constant state of flux. And maybe this is how we might have to think about Greekness. But Seferis did have his own ideas about Greekness, too. When asked about ideas of Greekness and how the poet can interplay with history, he said, in my youth, there was an enormous amount of discussion about the problem of knowing or trying to define what is Greek and what is not Greek, praising one thing as Greek and condemning something else as un-Greek, trying, in short, to establish the real Greek tradition. So I wrote, Greekness is the sum of the authentic works which are going to be produced by Greeks. We cannot say that we have some works creating the conscience of Greece. We see a line, but surrounded by large margins of dar darkness. 
And now, when we have a generation of immigrants who has grown up in Greece and perhaps are writing in Greek and adding their voices to the literary and cultural discourse, the idea of Greekness takes on yet another dimension. I was in Athens this past August when I came across this aforementioned quote and one night over drinks was discussing it with a friend. He is French but has lived and worked in Athens for 15 years and I was particularly interested about his ideas because he seems to be, seems in some ways so Greek to me and in other ways somehow not. The first thing that stood out to him was that he didn't think a French writer would neither be asked about such nor think about things and that maybe Greek has become and then he didn't know the word in English or French, only Greek, mia enya. A concept I asked, a concern, I had heard the word but in a slightly different context, the phrase enya used to mean, don't worry. Yes, he said, but not quite, something stronger. And then something else came up and we dropped the topic, but I was intrigued, as I always am when certain words will work in one language, but we can't quite come up with as equivalent in another. This alone seemed to be a meta concern of our entire discussion. Later I investigated, asking my friend Artemis about the etymology of the word, which she told me was nous, no. Odysseus came to know the noose of many people, she said, how they framed, saw, sensed, understood, perceived, and conceived of the world. So maybe it's beyond concept, a perception, I thought, a way of being in the world. Maybe, I wondered, a sort of narrative? Could the constant question, the burning concern of defining Greekness, be ultimately Greekness itself? Greece's position in Europe is persistently questioned. I was talking with an Italian journalist who asked me what I thought, where I thought Greece's place was in Europe. Did it belong there? Was it more Western or Eastern? I understand part of this has to do with ge geographical locale. But Greece is a part of Europe and has been considered such for a long time. What bothers me both about the question is its frame of reference. Gre Greekness and Greece are always framed with what is around it. Do people talk about Italian identity or French or German with a frame of reference outside itself? Are the Italians consistently aware of and being asked how people see them? I asked him this. He admitted I had a point. And yet, Greece is somehow decidedly different. In a June 2011 op-ed in the New York Times, historian Mark Mazower beautifully and eloquently argued that Greece has always been, quote, on the forefront of evolution. He writes, quote, the European Union was supposed to shore up a fragmented Europe to consolidate its democratic potential and to transform the continent into a force capable of competing on the global stage. It is perhaps fitting, he continues, that one of Europe's oldest and most democratic nation states should be on the new front line, throwing all these achievements into question. Once again, Greece is on the forefront of the future, uh, on the forefront of the fight for the future, unquote. I don't like to do those little things. I feel th strange about it, but I'll try. Um, if there's any one thing that I feel is particularly Greek, it's this particular self-consciousness there, a self-awareness of how Greeks appear to the outside world and how they are, and the others, in dialogue with their past. It is not in insecurity so much as it is extreme self-awareness. How could you not be when your office overlooks the Acropolis and you watch the BBC to see the so-called riots that are occurring 10 minutes from your place? At the same time, the world, particularly Europe, continues to look at Greece to see how it might define and shape them. And perhaps what is decidedly Greek is a keen awareness of this position, of being on the forefront and also being watched, actor and observer, he who feels and he who sees himself feeling, she who suffers and she who sees herself suffering. I kept thinking about ways of being in the world, of the narratives we construct for ourselves. And Greekness is a narrative that is very much in flux. With Europe's condescension, Greekness has of late been also taken as something to be maligned. With the way of life, the Greeks of my generation have grown accustomed to proving unsustainable, with no new solutions for how to transition into something more workable, yet humane, Greeks, it seems, have been exiled from the inside out. Bound to their country by love and family and home, but also feeling as if that country they imagine has betrayed them, been betrayed, or simply no longer exists. Or if it does exist, they feel they have no agency in its actual workings or future. Four, exile. George Seferis wrote, they were lovely, your eyes, but you didn't know where to look. Nor did I know where to look, I without a country, I who go on struggling here, how many times around. What do we mean when we talk about exile? For starters, there's the general con connotation of the word, being away from home. 
Whereas the idea of exile is no stranger to the Greek consciousness. There were the Asia Minor exiles of 1922. There were exiles in Tashkent. There were self-exiles who landed all over the place. The Parthenon marbles or the Elgin marbles, depending on your perspective and stance, have also been referred to as exiles. There were the exiles who left Greece after, uh, after the Ottoman rule, and there were those exiled to island prisons, such as Makronisos during the Civil War, the 1950s, and the military dictatorship. During the Greek government was in exile in Egypt, and during this time, George Seferis, as part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, accompanied it. Accompanied it. it. I'll return you, to, return you to his words a bit later. But now I'm reminded of the movie Before Night Falls, based on the life of the Cuban poet, Ronaldo Arenas. Arenas says, after he's left Cuba and found himself living a very meager existence in New York, for the moment, my name is Ronaldo Arenas, and I'm a citizen of nowhere. The State Department has declared me stateless, so legally, I don't exist. Exile can be seen just in terms of national identity, but also in the other meaning of stateless, without a position, without a condition. Is it without a way of being in the world, or does the state of exile become that way of being? Perhaps the state of exile can be seen as the ability to hold two separate worlds in the mind at once, citizens of nowhere, or maybe everywhere. Fiction writer Nick Papandreou writes in an, exile in an essay about exile, let's pause briefly with that word exile. In Greek, the word for exile is exoria. Etymologically speaking, the term is made of two words, exo for outer and oria for boundaries. Together, its literal meaning is outside the borders or boundaries. And Greece always exists outside of its metaphorical borders, just as it does within them. There's the Greek, Greece, Greek conceived by the West, mostly made up of ideas of ancient Greece, and then there's the Greece that operates within the borders of Greece and viewed from within and without. To be Greek is something that is defined both from within and decidedly outside the borders, from the foreign Western gaze, specifically Western gaze, and also, of course, from the past. Papandreou continues with his anal analysis of the word exodia. A more metaphoric meaning could be outside definition. Outside definition. What does it mean to be outside definition? For some reason, I can't help but think of the it's complicated relationship status on Facebook. <laughs> Can we think of it as beyond definition, undefinable? And let's think about the idea of what is defined and also what is definite. In Keeley's Paris Review interview, he asked Seferis, you once said that there is no ancient Greece in Greece. What do you mean by that? Seferis replied, I meant Greece as a continuous process. In English, the expression ancient Greece includes the meaning of finished, whereas for us, Greece goes on living, for better or for worse. It is in life, has not expired yet. That to me could mean undefined, indefinite, still becoming a work in progress. And because Greeks are both within their borders and somewhere outside them, watching themselves being watched, because Greece is both very old and very new, these things forever shape its identity. It's important not to get stuck on only one stage of this narrative, but to see the narrative as active. Perhaps this is the key to understanding Greekness. It's dynamic, and it's uncertain, indefinite, in between. This in-betweenness could be related to what Plato calls metaxi, being between earth and the heavens, between knowledge and mystery, or between necessity and resource, ignorance and wisdom. The poet Adam Zagielski writes that, it's a that it defines a situation of the human, a being who is incurably en route, he continues, we're always in between, and our constant motion always betrays the other side in some way. So Greekness, in its state of flux and continuity, should never become an argument for nationalism, let alone xenophobism or racism. It is too complicated to reduce to one thing. In fact, it seems it is exactly set up against such simplistic ways of thinking. It is global, cosmopolitan, never static. It's not reductive, and in a world where we are increasingly discarding active, thoughtful discourse for a like button on Facebook, it's important to remember this. Five, porous borders. Yet the, the neo-Nazi party Golden, Do Golden Dawn is trying to, ironically and antithetically, co-opt the idea of Greekness to propagate ra racism and hate. This frightening turn of nationalism in Greece has gone beyond a quiet xenophobia, which is always troubling still, or the simple glorification of all things Greek. It's the vilification of the other to glorify the self, a Greek self that has been condescended to and humiliated, and it goes beyond ethnic tensions or quiet disdain for immigrants that veiled under severe immigration policies. I recently learned that in 1975, when former Greek junta leader George Papadopoulos was in jail, he gave orders to Nikolaos Michalodiakos to form Golden Dawn. 
If this doesn't feel like a mafia-inspired move, I don't know what does. And now, almost 40 years later, Golden Dawn is not a small group existing on the peripheral fringe of Greek politics, gaining popularity by it is gaining popularity by the day. Currently, it holds 18 parliamentary seats, and within at least 10 percent, some claim at least as high as 20 percent of the electorate of the electorate. In 2009, it received 0.29 percent. To put things in perspective, PASOK, the Socialist Party, which for the past 30 years been one of the Greece's one of Greece's top two ruling parties, currently has only 8 percent support. And Golden Dawn behaves less like a legitimate party and more like a racist gang. They terrorize immigrant neighborhoods and walk through, asserting their dominance, kicking over fruit stands, or blitzing through on motorcycles. Among non-immigrants, they use gang, stare, gang scare tactics and offer so-called Good Samaritan behavior to force allegiance. Join us or else. Are you for us or against us, they're asking. They offer blood drives and food and clothing drives, but only want the recipients to be Greek and to prove it. Beatings and threats have become commonplace, and Golden Dawn seems determined to rid Greece of its so-called filth. In perhaps an attempt to unaffiliate themselves from the police, Golden Dawn said that the police, quote, allow Muslim illegal immigrants to destroy the center of Athens. But there are more and more reports of the police and Golden Dawn working together, of the police increasingly looking the other way when confronted with evidence of violence, even while it's happening. A report by Human Rights Watch said that illegal immigrants are routinely discouraged from filing official complaints and also told they have to pay a fee to do so. Some have reported that the police have told them to simply fight back themselves or that police, when called with complaints about immigrant-related crime, have redirected the callers to Golden Dawn. These are not isolated instance instances. After the May 2012 elections, when Golden Dawn received a surprising percentage of the vote, many claimed that it wouldn't be repeated in the June elections, that people would now realize exactly what they voted for and not repeat the vote. How wrong they were. When I was in Athens in May, right after the elections, I was walking through Syntagma Square with a friend. We had just gone for drinks with some others and were walking to catch the metro. The night was warm and quiet, but not the eerie quietness that I had noticed in Athens, in parts of Athens during this crisis. People were out, talking, drinking, having dinner. Syntagba was by no means bustling, but it didn't feel deserted. I had just commented to my friend that for a moment Athens seemed normal. Hmm, was all she said. The last time we were in Syntagma the year, together, the year before, we ducked into a cab on an otherwise deserted street to escape the tear gas. She lives in Athens and perhaps didn't trust the idea of normal. And only moments later, we began to hear shouting and chanting. And we stood in disbelief, no, disgust, no, horror, as we watched a Golden Dawn rally march right by us. Oh my God, my friend said, almost unable to get it out. It's Christi Avgi. And we stood paralyzed. I filmed it with my camera up in the air while my hand shook, wondering what I would do if someone snatched it out of my hand, confronted me. First came the anger, then the disgust, then eeriness, then fear. The swastikas, the torches, the shouting for foreigners to get out of Greece. I don't know who I had expected would join such a party, perhaps youngish male thugs or old relics from the junta, but I was surprised to see young women, girls the age of my students here at the university, and even younger, ponytailed, flip-flopped, marching along, shouting. On the way back home on the train platform, an African woman, perhaps in her 40s, asked me in Greek for directions. When we got on the train, she sat next to me, and when she got off at her stop, she nodded and slipped away. I can only imagine what she was thinking. When I was back in Athens in August, visiting my publisher on Perio Street near Ammonia, the streets, normally filled with Asian and African immigrants, felt eerily quiet, not just in the way certain areas of Athens empty out in August, I don't want to make assumptions, but my guess this segment of the population did not retreat to their villas on Mykonos. It turned out just a few days earlier, in less than 72 hours, 7,000 immigrants were rounded up, papers checked, taken in for questioning. Out of the 7,000, 2,000 were arrested. I imagine the rest were able to return to their homes, but still, the streets felt utterly disappeared. Where did everybody go? Golden Dawn's rage isn't only directed against immigrants and foreigners. Just over a week ago, on September 25th, Golden Dawn rallied for its supporters to, quote, isolate our anarchists and leftists at a rally in Athens. Golden Dawn is not only terrorizing immigrants, but Greeks whose opinions they don't agree with. This is extremism to its extreme. It is fascism. Demo democracy should allow for freedom of speech, yes, but the way hate speech is tolerated should be a question all of us should be asking. 
when that speech manifests in actions that threaten the well-being, safety, and lives of its citizens, is this democracy in action or something else entirely? This is no longer a Greek problem. It's European, it is global, and it is human. Europe and the rest of the world have still not healed from the atrocities of World War II. I don't think much more needs to be said to make this point. The e EU has its flawed policies, or perhaps policies that have not been well thought out. The 2003 Agreement of Dublin II, under-resourced and not well thought out as well, holds that asylum seekers to EU countries must be processed in the country where they enter first. Almost 8 out of 10 illegal migrants to Europe enter through Greece, and many are staying there. There are more than 100,000 migrants in Greece now, and most of them are stuck. This would be fine if immigrants were being dropped from the sky all over Europe and distributed, four in Germany, a few in Finland, a smattering in France, and Italy and Norway. But of course it's the border countries that absorb the immigrants, and these are also some of the poorer countries of Europe. Malta, for instance, received more asylum requests per capita than any other EU country, 4,500 applications per million inhabitants who wait in unhealthy detention centers, sometimes up to 18 months. In 2010, 90% of migrates, migrants entered at the Turkish-Greek border, and the large influx of bodies has pushed health and social services to the extreme. Add to this the collapsing middle class, people with once stable jobs and their basic needs me met needing sudden emergency assistance, and there is a huge humanitarian crisis at hand. A piece in The Guardian in June highlighting this crisis mentioned a Kurdish teacher who fled Syria six months earlier for Athens. In Syria, we, will be we would be killed by guns, he said. Here, we'll be killed by the econ economy. But just these words gave me chills, because as I've mentioned before, there is now another frightening force that could kill them. I'm not saying that the issue of immigration in Greece is not a problem. In fact, the situation is dire. Greece's population is barely 11 million. One million are immigrants, and it's estimated 400,000 are unaccounted for. The plight of the refugee and migrant has been intensified by the crisis. How can they not feel constantly afraid? And the presence of so many extra bodies in Greece has certainly strained Greece's already too taxed health and public services, but they are not the source of the current crisis. The problem of immigration in Greece is a European problem as well, not a Greek one. Greece ha Greeks have just, by location and border, become the entry point. European policy forces border countries to not only absorb the burden of applying for asylum, but also to absorb the bodies. Even when Greece's times were good, it would not have been able to absorb such an administrative and resource burden. Now it's impossible. The backlog of asylum applications has reached 60,000 at least, for one, and this says nothing of the fact that even if the applications were processed, there are not enough resources to port, support the asylum seekers. But Europe's way of looking for solutions has been condescending, a condescending slap on the wrist, a power game, and this is a huge flaw in thinking. Punishment is not a solution. When I was grounded as a teenager, and I was grounded often, I spent those long evenings alone in my room. This was pre-internet, pre-Facebook, pre-text messaging, planning my escape, ways out of the window, covert pickups in the middle of the night, better ways not to get caught. I don't think of myself as dishonest or sketchy, but I do think people behave in extreme ways if they feel they are trapped. And again, let me make one small general assumption about Greeks. I don't think that a country that has been slapped on the wrist and humiliated is going to sit around in its room and behave. It's going to find a way to get out. It's going to find a way to get around the rules. Six, Athens, notice your poet, Lefteris Pulios wrote, and turn your submissive shoulder to a new floor of madness. In February 1951, George Seferis noted in his diary that when walking down the street in a cramped lot near Amelias Avenue, he saw a carousel. He described it as such, riderless wooden ponies going round and round while the hand organ whined, the instantaneous feeling that this is the picture of our country's political life. And now, 60 years later, we're still going in circles, this time, according to economic anal analyst and blogger Yanis Varoufakis, like an idiot cat chasing its own tail. Both examples imply lack of movement forward, but simply an exhausting repetition of paths that get one nowhere except to either the point of view of exhaustion or stupidity. The circle of blame goes nowhere. We vote them in, political and economic analysis, or we vote them in, Yanis Varoufakis has said about Greeks and their politicians. It is true, Greeks are not blameless, and I understand Germany and Europe don't want to pay for Greece's overspended, bloated public sector, or more important, years of mismanagement, tax evasion, and unsustainable policy. 
Greek politicians do need to acknowledge the ways in which they steered their country down the wrong path, the way in which they've made the way of life that Greeks, Greeks enjoyed for decades not simply feel like a basic right, or, but more importantly, a sustainable one. But what's done is done, and punishment as solution is going to, is going to stunt any sort of progress. It's not as if Greece has been presented with the thoughtful, valid choices, but instead with the insistence that it will pay and pay and pay for its mistakes. Vote the right way or else, Europe told them. Or else what? In a country where it seems people are very committed to the party they supported, the voting this time around sometimes defied loyalties and even ideology. There was much confusion as to what the better choice was. And I think this confusion came from the fact there was no sense of explanation for what had gone wrong to begin with. No admissions of culpability. Sometimes you need an apology before you can heal. It's as simple as that. Extremes often become more appealing when the mainstream has failed. Or maybe sometimes it's that the mainstream has, in a sense, become extreme. Extreme as unsensible. Trying to please apathetic Europe at all costs, it has set itself up for far more devastation to come and has abandoned what the goals of a democratic government should be, to strengthen, maintain, and improve its institution's democratic legitimacy and to work to improve their effectiveness. And yes, to care for and advocate for its citizens. This is both a Greek and European problem. I don't have the solutions, obviously, and among many other things, it will surely take a vision of more than a few. We can talk about the rise of extremes when people are living in times of uncertainty, but wh what we really need to examine is what happens when people are pushed to the extreme. 7. Nightmare in Athens Sometimes when I read New York Times columnist Paul Krugman, I wonder if the poor guy is going to have a stroke. If he feels as though he's been living in a nightmare in which he's screaming, but no sound is coming out. Let's take a look at some of his column headlines over the past two years. July 1, 2010. The myth of austerity. OK, nothing particularly harsh, but he was doing a basic argumentative strategy. Take something that is accepted as good or preferable and show why the thinking is flawed. He gets more impassioned on March 24, 2011, calling it the austerity delusion. On April 26, he writes the death of a fairy tale. And in May, on May 22, when austerity fails. On June 14, 2011, he attacks the argument itself, the bad logic of fiscal austerity, and, and, on May and, and, before that, or, and after that, perhaps deciding that his words such as bad and death in the title were throwing people off, go slightly more neutral, the austerity agenda. And then it becomes too much for him. The most recent headline at the end of September read, Europe's, Europe's austerity madness. And remember, madness is both lunacy and sheer folly. And it's not as though Paul Krugman is some obscure blogger who riles up his few hundred followers. He is a mainstream voice in an international newspaper. People read him around the world. So Greeks are once again watching themselves being watched. If there's any sort of thing as Greek identity, it is one of duality. He who observes and he who sees himself being observed. He who is punished and he who sees himself being punished. He who blames and sees himself being blamed. The writer Charles Baxter, in his essay, Dysfunctional Narratives, writes the following. What difference does it make to writers of stories if public figures are denying their responsibility for their own actions? So what if they are, in effect, refusing to tell their own stories accurately? Well, to make an obvious point, they create a climate in which social narratives are designed to be deliberately incoherent and misleading. Such narratives humiliate the act of storytelling. You can argue that a coherent narrative can manage to explain public events, and you can reconstruct a story if someone says, I made a mistake, or we did that. You can't reconstruct a story. You can't even know what the story is if everyone was saying, if everyone is saying, mistakes were made. Who made them? Everybody made them, and no one did, and it's a history anyway, so let's forget about it. Every story is a history, however, and when there is no comprehensible story, there is no history. The past, under these circumstances, becomes an unreadable mess. When we hear words like deniability, we are in the presence of narrative dysfunction, a phrase employed by the poet C.K. Williams to describe the process by which we lose track of the story of ourselves, the story who, that tells us who we are supposed to be and how we are supposed to act. So what is happening now is what always happens in politics. The right blames the left and the left the right or the center. The center equates anything not aligned with the status quo as problematic, thereby eliminating nuance altogether. The inherent and important differences, say, between a left-wing political party like Syriza and a neo-Nazi group like Golden Dawn. 
There is no culpability because both Europe and the Greek government are acknowledging that mistakes were made, but there are no actor nor an observer in the making. And without actors or observers, the Greeks are left without a narrative. They are in a moment of narrative dysfunction. Who are we? How are we supposed to act? There is nothing to cling to. Dear God, wrote George Seferis in his journal when he was working in Egypt in World War II, look kindly on our weaknesses. Here in the Middle East, we're sinking all the time. We're not people anymore. We're exiles. But we don't all share the same exile. There are many conditions of exile as there are of us. We're the crew of a ship that's gone down, each one fighting for his life, each one separately, astride his own piece of flotsam. And on a sinking ship, people cling to anything to ensure their survival. Europe needs to realize this. Narratives, you see, are complex. They are not simply a recording of events, as the writer Peter Churchy notes, but acts of translation. Narratives create the experience. Europe must place itself in an ongoing narrative of Europeness to define itself as not with beginnings and ends, but with something continual, to see itself as both very old and very new, and to hold these two competing ideas in the mind at the same time, without condescension, without punishment. Europe needs Greece, and Greece needs Europe. As Manos Hatsidakis has said, I feel Greek if this means European, and European if this includes my Greekness. Their narratives are and should be inextricable, and Europe cannot play the role of fraud police if they are complicit in and integral to the narrative. Let's go back to the Greek War of Independence and hear not a Greek voice, but of the English romantic per poet Percy Bysshe Shelley in the preface to his epic poem, Hellas, written in 1821. The apathy of the rulers of the civilized world to the astonishing circumstances of the descendants of that nation, Greece, to which they owe their civilization, rising as it were from the ashes of their ruin, is something perfectly inexplicable to a mere spectator of the shows of this mortal scene. We are all Greeks. Thank you.